Welcome everybody to the Beagle Alliance free virtual town hall. We're very thrilled to have Jessica Scott Reed, longtime animal advocate and journalist with us today. I am Lori Cohen, the executive director of the Beagle Alliance. We are going to begin and as per usual, we are recording this so it'll be up on our website and on YouTube at a later date. Welcome Jessica, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, this is so Absolutely. cool. Absolutely. As we were saying, it's a beautiful night, so we're here online. <laughs> yeah, I have a beautiful window in front of me, so it's yeah, okay. All perfect, perfect. Well, thank you. I know, uh, you know, you've been in in the animal welfare world for a very long time. Uh, just one of the most incredible animal welfare advocates in Canada, truly. Tell me, tell us. Um, what, how did you get started? And and start from the beginning. When did you realize that animals were just so unbelievably important to you? And and how did that work? Oh gosh, if we're gonna go right to the beginning, go back, I, go back. When I'm when I was probably I don't know eight years old. I'm trying to think about when Free Willy came out, the movie Free Willy. <laughs> because honestly, that that was a catalyst for me. That was when not even not even just Free Willy, but there was a time when I was a child, there was a club called Kids for Saving Earth in the 90s. That was the beginning of when we started fighting um, against, um, I guess it wasn't even climate change at the time. It was the ozone layer, the hole in the ozone layer. Yes. So this was way back in the 90s as a child when I knew I cared about animals and the planet. And I was trying to find these resources and these clubs and that evolved as I grew up and as the culture in the world changed to care more about animals and the planet um, and when I was in university I became a vegetarian for a short time uh, at that time there wasn't as much resources as we have now so I didn't do a very good job of it uh, and then right before I had my daughter Clover um, almost eight years ago I really had to reevaluate my values and that's when I realized that um, I wanted to go vegan and I cared so much about animals that I couldn't feed them to my daughter. But in the meantime, before that, both personally and professionally, I was going down this path of animal welfare. Before you get into veganism, there's always animal welfare. And that's when I was starting to look into things like animal research, um, circuses, zoos, the use of fur and fashion, all of these sort of outside of food scenarios, food scenarios that that I really started to, to find I could make a difference. And I started writing about them as a journalist in my work. Um, and that all came together when my daughter was born, both um, as a writer and as a person, um, caring about animals, both in my everyday life and in my writing work. And things have just taken off ever since. And so now I do this job full time and I live it full time too. That's amazing. Yeah. And the key is that you live it full time too. You're, it is an actual part of your world. Um, now tell me on that note, there's always one and, and maybe it's not true for you because it sounds like the whole free willy and just learning about what was going on in the world, which is super cool. Um, was there a specific animal growing up in your life that that you had a, a bond with that maybe you realized, OK, this is an important relationship to me? I mean, I think for so many of us, it starts with with our companion animals. I grew up with cats. Um, I remember riding horses as a kid at uh, Lazy H Ranch in Birdsell Park. And <laughs> even as I don't think I've ever told anybody this story before, but as a, as a, a kid, a preteen, we would go on these trail rides and there was um, horses we would ride. And the, the cowboy who was in charge of setting up these trail rides and, you know, these horses, they walked this same trail over and over and over again. As kids, you don't see it, but now I do. And I could see he was mistreating these horses, really um, hitting them and, and getting them to stay in line because trail horses, that's what they have to do is stay in line. And I wrote a letter mistreated and I wrote a letter to the, I don't know, owner of Lazy H Ranch and expressing my um, feelings about how, about this animal, these animals being mistreated by this cowboy. My mom admitted to me later in life as an adult that she never sent the letter. <laughs> oh, she, because I don't even think she knew where to send it. <laughs> but she knew that even as a child, I needed to write about it. I needed to write it out, write out my feelings. And that was sort of one of my first moments of advocacy and activism was writing to the owner, whoever this person was of Lazy H Ranch, about this cowboy mistreating these animals. And she kept the letter and showed it to me later on in life and showed me where this all began. So 
in addition to where, you know, we fall in love with our companion animals, cats in the later, I, I had my first dog at 17, who I rescued off the street. I think this, this experience with horses was quite profound in my love for animals. And your love for writing. It's funny that it was a part of it. Yeah. And, and thanks. Thank you that you told that story for the first time. <laughs> did do you have the letter? Did, did you keep do you keep did you keep the letter? I think my mom has the letter. I think my mom has the letter. Okay. Yeah. I think I think it was quite scathing. I think that might be why it. Because there was like this 12-year-old that was really pissed off. And like, probably that's why she didn't send it. But honestly, like, I would love to see it now because I'm like, this is what I do for a living is write a really <laughs> right. letter in the paper <laughs> about animals being mistreated. So is it safe to say that your writing has become more refined or? <laughs> I'm, not <sure. laughs> I'm not sure that it has. Um, perhaps, perhaps just a bigger platform. I don't know. <laughs> Awesome. Oh, that's so good. Um, what tell us about a little bit, like tell me more, because I I don't honestly, I wasn't really in. I loved my animals and um and I really until I met my dog behind me that you commented on his picture, I didn't really know about animal testing. I just had my relationship with my animals. I knew it was special. I was not in the animal welfare world until I found out about animal testing. Uh, when I adopted my rescue beagle. So I feel, and, and then I worked for a U.S. organization. So I wasn't really in tune with Canada. And I feel a little bit like mm -hmm. I'm playing catch up in the animal welfare world now. Mm -hmm. And I kind of count on all of you guys who have pioneered all of just everything and, and advocacy. And um, so tell, tell us all a little bit about the Pawn Order and that podcast, because that oh, yeah. is just really cool. Yeah. And you know what, I, it's, it's funny you, you talk about your experience, because I felt like that in my time working with Animal Justice um, on the Pawn Order po podcast allowed me to catch up. Because prior to that, I had been living in Europe for over a decade, which people didn't really know because I was writing for Canadian newspapers while living over there. No mm. one knew, because you can do that. And so when I moved back to Canada... Uh, and then I started doing this as a full-time job. I got asked to join the Pawn Order podcast. So it was a podcast that um, was produced by, by Animal Justice, which is an animal um, legal protection organization in Canada. Everyone knows who they are. Um, and they had been doing this great podcast for a few years before I joined. Um, and they talked about um, sort of issues and progress in the legal world for animals in Canada and beyond. And they wanted to bring in a little bit more culture. So they brought me on to talk about some things in the news and, and that helped me play catch up on issues in Canada, animal welfare, and animal rights issues in Canada. So that was a really great experience. I was really sad to see it end. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our executive director at Animal Justice, Camille Labchuk, her time is so, so precious. She's doing such incredible work um, that unfortunately the podcast just sort of saw its end. Um, we may bring it back. I don't know. I'm always hopeful that there might be some, you know, we pop up um, episodes or something that may happen. I don't think it's quite dead yet. Well, that, yeah, well, 90 episodes, it, it's not a short run. I mean, no, it's, I, and I just came in for the tail end. So they did a lot of work before. Yeah, me. that's what yeah. Heard. Yeah, that's, I mean, well, we know, and that again, I play catch up with Camille and all that they do, etc. Um, I'm just curious. Okay, well, so tell us a little bit about writing and how you've seen your writing change in terms of the subject matter with animal welfare. Like how, how have you changed and how have you seen Canada change as you've been a journalist? Yeah. Well, that's, that's, there's a lot in there. So personally, like I said, I started writing about animal welfare a decade ago. So I was writing more about things like animal testing, zoos, um, circuses, things that were a little bit more mainstream, more socially acceptable, more agreeable amongst populations that, you know, most people would agree those things are not a good idea and that they should end. Um, and then personally, I progressed towards more animal rights issues and veganism issues in my writing. But at the same time, the world was shifting. So we saw, you know, sort of 
veganism around, you know, 2018, 2019 become way more of a popular topic, right? So Beyond Meat hit the mainstream, uh, plant-based milks hit the mainstream, and that made me very busy. And it also gave me a great um, credibility in my work to be able to talk about this variety of things. So I like to balance my work talking about companion animals, talking about issues like animal testing, and then about issues around the food system. Um, and I think having that very holistic, well-balanced perspective, I, I don't say that I just write about animal rights, I say animal rights and welfare, because in some cases writing about animal welfare is necessary because we have these animals that are in these systems, uh, including food systems and, and research systems, where advocating for their better treatment is a step, right? We have to we have to talk about their treatment as a step. Um, and thankfully the world was shifting too, but I'll say things have shifted again in the last couple of years. So we've seen some progress in animal welfare issues. For example, I think here in Winnipeg, we're not allowed wild animals and circuses anymore. That's not allowed. Um, but the zoo remains a very popular place. Um, we've had in Canada the passing of the ending of toxicity testing on animals, which was a massive win. But we'll talk about later, I'm sure you'll ask me. There's been some shortcomings of that and some things that are going on in the future that are not progressive. So we've had some wins and some losses. And then if you're talking about food systems and veganism and plant-based food alternatives, we've seen a backlash to plant-based food alternatives, uh, meat alternatives from the meat and dairy industries that are really turning people against those things with their marketing. So it's a constant battle. And I'm sure you know that, that when we're talking about animal rights or animal welfare, the better treatment of animals or the liberation of animals from systems, it's tough. It's tough, but we keep going. Yeah, it, that's a good point. And it is, a, I mean, I always call it, we're, we're walking a fine line because- yes we don't we our focus is animal testing and and animals and testing and we have no reason to touch we're very focused in that and and we stick to that subject matter however mm -hmm. there's for all the rescue that you do there's people who are still saying that well you're not doing enough you have to shut down the places but the thing is is that that's where the animal welfare comes in because you there's animal yes we are trying to advocate for non-animal use in research however we also have to have a relationship with the facilities or create a relationship with the facilities because there's animals there who will be there for years animal testing isn't ending tomorrow and therefore we can't hate on the facilities. We need to work with them so that there's a welfare system going on within the laboratories and that rehoming can be a part of it. But then on the flip side, rescue the animals and advocate. And so you're just walking this tightrope all the time yes. is what I feel yes. you're saying. And they're there right now, right? The animals are in these systems right uh -huh. now, whether it's yeah. the research systems or the food systems, they're there right now. And like you said, it's not going to end tomorrow. And people often ask me how I'm able to contribute my writing to places like the Globe and Mail or the Toronto Star on topics that are somewhat controversial and, and that other people have failed to, to get into these publications. And I my motto always is be clever, not crazy. It's very easy to be an abolitionist. I, I fen fundamentally am an abolitionist where I, I want these systems to end, but I am realistic in that they, these animals are trapped in these systems right now. And we need to talk to mainstream audiences, readers of the Globe and Mail, millions of people, millions of Canadians that may be hearing these ideas and topics for the first time ever. Absolutely. We can't hit them. We can't hit them with this must end now right off the bat, right? Yeah. We need to educate. We need to take steps. And not everybody agrees with that, but that's how I've made my career. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. That is the basis of how we work. Uh, Brenda and I've had this conversation on the hours, hours, hours that we've been on the road together <laughs> getting dogs. And 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 that's that's the stance that we take as well. And for us, the focus is dogs. And that is not because we're trying to compare dogs to any other animals. The bottom line is that every single person in Canada either is in love with their dog, has a dog, or knows somebody who has a dog and is in love with their dog. Dogs by far are man's best friend, for lack of a better way of putting it. 
And the way in our, my, our, at the Beagle Alliance, our humble opinion is that we are, the, the end of animal testing begins with the dogs. Yeah, I think you're absolutely, absolutely right. I've written about this before. We call them, you know, the gateway animal, right? So, right? I mean, if ever, if anybody's ever heard of Elwood's dog meat, yeah. So yes. <laughs> it's a very clever activist strategy, Elwood's dog meat, and and it's based on the fact that people care about dogs, and you can get people to consider things they've never considered before when we utilize our love for dogs. Yeah. And I know I've written before about the amount of dogs that are used in animal testing and research and education in Canada. The numbers, of course, are staggering in the thousands. And people are shocked. Mm -hmm. And if you were to use that same conversation about mice or rabbits, they're less shocked because, first of all, those are the those are the stereotypical animals used in nature exactly. that people think about. And it's like they're more they're more willing to just excuse it, right? Like, oh well, we it's that false dichotomy. Oh well, we need to test on those animals to be able to save humans. But the minute you say it's dogs, they're like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. Maybe yeah. we don't. Maybe we don't need tests on animals to save humans. Oh, really? Oh, really? It, it, well, that's and it's true. The relationship is significant. It's important. It's it is definitely you know as you say the gateway. It's we I mean we see it all the time. So many of the people who even apply to foster or adopt mm -hmm. are it's because they're in love with dogs and and thankfully. Um, and that is somewhat of a blessing for us yeah. because, of course, it, for the most part, 90% the people that apply, we get, we get the opportunity to educate them about animal mm -hmm. testing. Mm -hmm. And all they want to do is help a dog or a beagle, right. a beagle right. mostly. <laughs> um, takes a special person to have a beagle. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I've had it before and it, it, it's a special experience. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, even a even a um, moderately non-traumatized beagle is, <laughs> is, a, is a problem child sometimes, but um, any hound. But uh, mine actually, I, I was sitting here distracted for a moment because mine was walking across my dining room table while I was on here. And I thought, oh, yeah, if Brenda could see this, she'd be calling me a bad mother and uh, I can't do anything because she's doing it. And she must somehow know I can't leave the screen right yeah. now. <laughs> no, they know. they know when you're on a meeting and you can't walk away. You're, yeah, you're exactly. Exactly. They know. Yeah. Yeah, no, but I, I so agree with you and I love hearing it because I think that is absolutely clever and and it is, I mean, you have to be pragmatic in that way. You are reaching so many people through the globe. That's who you want to reach. The, we, yeah. we could, we, I could preach to the choir all day long and people will agree with me left, right and center and that's fantastic. But that small core group is not going to make the difference Right. In in the long run, it's got to be the masses, and we have to, right. you know, say hey. Right. And I like to tell people too, uh, is that because animal testing testing on animals doesn't translate, you don't have to. It is a societal issue. You don't have to be yeah. in love with animals to realize that animal testing is a waste of our taxpayer dollars. <laughs> And it's not curing your grandma's Alzheimer's tomorrow or any other day. And that's a big deal. And that that's one of my greatest selling points I find when I'm writing about this topic. So I've written about, so for example, Dr. Charu and the Canadian Center for Alternatives to Animal Methods has been one of my greatest muses. I've written about her and her work in every publication I can so far, I think like almost half a dozen times because it's not really about the animals i mean for us it is right but you're able to reach so many more people when you do exactly how you just described when you talk to people about the fact that their dad their grandma their brother is not going to get a cure because we are wasting time money and resources on testing on animals that pisses people off absolutely and i remember my mom first reading one of my first stories about dr charu and she goes oh my god People need to know this. I said, we're working on it. We're, working on it. we're trying. And every time I write about her, every time I hear her speak, my mom is always just beside herself. Holy shit. People need to know about this. And it's true. They do. Because if people, the, one of the first times I ever interviewed Dr. Charu, 
we were at the Canadian um, uh, Animal Law Conference in Halifax, and I met her at a Starbucks for our first ever first interview years ago. And the CIBC Run for the Cure was going on outside. Oh, funny, yeah. And that's when she told me one of her first amazing quotes. She has so many, and she goes, "I wish I could tell them." They're not running for the cure. They're running from the cure yeah. because there's so much money being raised. Yes. Go towards traditional testing methods, which are useless. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so much that, money raised. I yeah. mean, billions of dollars no, raised. Yeah. And I, and, and personally, and, and I, I, I'll just, obviously I'll say this personally as a charity uh, that, you know, I mean, I, I, what I wouldn't give for like 1% <laughs> exactly. of, you know, exactly. to be able to save animals and get them the medical help they need and truck around the country, you know, getting these dogs across North America. I mean, it, it's, it's so the opposite of what needs yeah. to happen. And also what I wouldn't give to have that money go to centers like Dr. Charu's, who we know yeah. are both saving humans and animals. And the interesting, the interesting thing about, I, I visited, uh, I, I took a tour a couple of years ago at, at when we were at the Animal Law Conference, Charu and I went back to her center. And it was such a simple statement that one of her scientist students said to me, but it was so profound for me. I felt kind of dumb that it didn't hit me before. But we were talking about things and he was showing me an uh, organ on a chip. You know, he was showing me all the different mm -hmm. alternative. We're going to call them alternative right now, but of course we want them to be the normal. Um, but he said, you know, Lori, not only are we not finding the cures, but so many cures are lost because yes. if they, so one would think that it would have hit in my brain that if you flip it, it's logical, but I had never heard anyone just say that statement because we're always thinking we're not finding cures. We're not finding treatments. We want the cure. We want the treatment. But the opposite then of course is true. We are not, if the model doesn't translate, right. we're discarding possible treatments that aren't yes. working in animals that could have worked in humans. So the flip, we're just spinning our spinning wheels. On really. They're sitting on a shelf somewhere. They're sitting on a shelf somewhere. Because yes. we have animal testing trials in this, what Dr. Charu and myself agreed to say, this archaic system. Yeah. that needs to be changed. And the unfortunate thing is, the, the most unfortunate thing, which is embarrassing, and I have a permission to talk about this, is that we're about to lose the center. Uh, okay, Literally, I wasn't sure if you had permission. I had a I feeling had you were gonna say that. that, okay. We are literally right now, and this is absolutely disgusting and embarrassing for a country like Canada. It is. We're about to lose the center. We literally are within a matter of weeks of losing it. And it's due to financial hardship because government, we have this great bill that's been passed, right? And I've written about this for the Globe and Mail. We have this great bill that's been passed. You know, the, the, the wheels are moving. We have the path forward to end toxicity testing on animals. And yet the center, the scientists, the brains who are able to put that into motion have lost funding. Mm -hmm. Actually, they never had funding. Like they've had, they've had amazing private funding to begin with, but that's right. disgusting. We had to rely on private funding. This should be a government, federally funded scenario, and it's not. And and again, we don't even have to make it about an outrage of the smaller group of animal welfare. Mm -hmm. The public in general should be outraged that the government money is going towards a system that fails its citizens right. in the health world and will not and has never offered funding to a system that would more readily translate than other countries in the world are yeah. funding. Other countries, they're federally funded centers for years. Like it's not even new. and. This is not this is not a system that fa just fails. It's over, we all know the stat. It's over ninety percent of the time. It exactly, fails. exactly. There's no other system in the medical world, or even in any kind of technological world, where like an over ninety percent failure rate would be allowed to continue for this long. 
never mind the massive amount of victims that it's causing. Like there's so many reasons, which is why my mom gets so pissed off every time I write about it. Cause she just says, this is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It, it really is. It really is. And, and so I'm just going to bring us back because I, I apologize. I feel like we're talking about animal testing when really I wanted to be talking about you, but oh, okay. <laughs> I, love, I love talking about issues. I've been writing about it for so many years and I, I, it's definitely something I want to write about more. It's just unfortunate that now I'm writing about how we're losing, we're losing. Yes. And hopefully, I mean, I, I hopefully the impact of this will have a turnaround to which like, I like to believe it's all going to work out yeah. and I, and I do, but the fact that it's happening should cause such an uproar, you know, in my opinion. But um, in terms of what you're writing though, what, and I know this, I mean, I know you have such a large body of work. However, what article do you think, do you feel has had the greatest impact in your opinion? And why do you think that was, even if it was given the time at which it was published? Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, the first thing that comes to mind was, it goes way back. And I know there's been a lot of great things ever since, but it was a turning point in my career. And I think a turning point in our culture was um, the end of 2018, McLean's magazine allowed me to declare 2019 the year of the vegan. And that was when we were able to talk about animal rights and welfare, about food systems, about animals used in exploitative industries like zoos, circuses, and animal testing in ways we had never talked about before. And it opened the floodgates. And for the next couple of years after that, I was able to kind of stand up on that article in McLean's magazine. It was their end of the year print magazine, you know, the profound things that had happened that year and what they predicted for the next year. And that catapulted my credibility and my platform to talk about all of these issues for the next few years. I'm, I mean, I'd like to think that there's been greater things that have happened since, but I know that that was definitely a turning point, not just for me, but I think, I mean, I don't want to oversell it, but for Canada in general, to be able to have these conversations in the media. Right. Um, and I would say even, you know, to talk about animal testing, they then let me, McLean's Magazine, I would say let me, like as if I'm so grateful that these publications let me talk about animals, but that's kind of how it feels still. Like, so they let me write about Dr. Charu's work, um, you know, disease in a dish and organ on a chip. Um, that was, I think, my maybe my next or my second next article after that. So that even allowed me the platform to talk about her and her work in McLean's Magazine, which is one of the most read articles or most read publications in the country. So, yeah, I think that would be it. That's what that that's what has kind of ushered me to where I am today. Oh, that's great. That's a great example. And yeah, and 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 covers exactly your goal, which is to hit the yeah. mainstream and to to have an opportunity to reach as many people as possible. And, and that's exactly what we feel has to happen as well. It's, it's, you know, we're not, the thing is that there is, I, I'm not a person who wants to rely on the government entirely. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot that a lot of places governments are that they shouldn't be, which mm -hmm. would be a non beagle Alliance conversation that I'll probably never have in public, but nonetheless, <laughs> you know, the, I mean, there's a lot of places the government need not be, but there are places like health Canada, you know, the, the health and welfare of, the citizens of the country, et cetera. I think that if they're going to be somewhere, then that would be it. And I think that this is such a societal issue that, you know, more people, whether you love animals or not, need to know that this is going on. And the more, and the goal should be to reach as many people because we, you know, we could all stay in the bubble and chat with people all like we are now and we have these great conversations, but you know, and this is kind of another reason why we do these town halls, just on and the fact that someone might come across it, somebody might want to join some, you know, just bringing anybody who wants to learn more and find out more, and then they're going to take it away and chat with people. And that's how we see the foster adopt process as well, because mm -hmm. 
as I say, most of these, most of the people who take on a dog, it's, it's a big job, but they didn't know about animal testing to begin with. And then now their whole family knows now the whole neighborhood knows because they're walking down the street with eventually with this new dog. And where did you get, you know, now the kids at school know because, you know, Joey has a new dog. And so, you know, that's, that's what has to happen, I think. And and that's great. I think it's so great, this idea of um of these animals volu not voluntarily, but but a byproduct of their existence and their rescue is that they become advocates without even knowing it or even doing yeah. anything. That they become messengers in the world into these mainstream. I love that this idea that it's not even uh, people who are aware of animal testing, who are fostering and adopting these dogs, and that you're bringing them into your community through the dogs. I mean, what what greater way to do it than that? Yeah, they do it. They do the job for us just Absolutely. by their very yeah. beautiful, forgiving nature. And you know, they, there's a lot to be said for what they teach us. Believe me, but uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. So okay, so speaking of which, what's what are what are you working on right now? what and we'll get to the bigger questions specific to the animal testing of course but what what's what are you working on what's your, what was your thing i know we're in mid 2024 but what's your 2024 so um i work now half time freelancing in canada so i always say i'll i'll write about animal issues in canadian media for whoever will let me um so that i do half time and then the other half time i work for sentient so sentient media i'm sure a lot of people know is a publication in the us uh, although we talk about global issues um talking about food systems and animal issues um, so I write for them half time. Uh, I do a lot of culture writing for them. So right now I'm currently working on a really cool story about the homesteading trend that's been taking off on social media uh, yeah. and sort of the darker side uh, of animals, um, dogs, cats, farmed animals who are being kept by these homesteaders um, that don't necessarily have experience taking care of animals or slaughtering them. So that's a cool story that's coming out next. Um, I'm finishing that now. I'm working with Vox on a big story that I can't talk about yet, but look for that. Um, and and I'm also serving on the board of directors at the Winnipeg Humane Society. Mm -hmm. So that's a really cool job that I'm doing, I guess a volunteer position that I'm doing in addition to my writing, which has been really eye-opening. Um, it's kind of brought me back to my roots before I started writing about um, animal rights and, and food systems and animal agriculture. Of course, I started writing about dogs and animal rescue as I am a rescuer too. Um, and so it's brought me back into the, the shelter world where I'm seeing a lot of the challenges and issues facing uh, companion animals again. So it's been great to go back to those roots and, and it's just such a wonderful organization. I'm so glad to be involved. It, they are. And there's been a lot going on with the Winnipeg Humane Society in the last little while. Some pretty crazy stories. And uh, yeah, I I get a lot of questions just about how I feel about the animal welfare world in Manitoba and, and the shelters, etc. Yeah. When you talk about walking a fine line. I mean, I feel like we're literally the center of Canada and that's the line we're walking on in the prairies dealing with animal welfare issues. Um, it's tricky. It's very, very tricky. Uh, thankfully, the Humane Society is being very progressive, um, starting to consider the welfare of all animals, not just companion animals. Um, but it's a lot to it's a lot to take on. So it's a, it's a challenge. But I'm really grateful that they're being progressive. They're reminding me so much of um, organizations like the Vancouver Humane Society and the Montreal SPCA that are really um, sort of broadening their reach to care for all animals. Agreed. And doing more advocacy. You can see it in their work. There's much more advocacy with the Winnipeg, Winnipeg Humane Society than ever before, which there's is... There's a whole new animal advocacy department um, that's focused on farmed animals um, and, and legal reform and, uh, you know, exotic animals and things just sort of outside dogs and cats, which is great to just expand and add. Yeah, yeah, they've they've really changed it up. It's nice to see. Yeah. So, okay, well, awesome. I was going to ask something about the Humane Society. It went out of my head listening to you. So, yeah, there there is the world of casual yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> off the cuff interview. Um given who's this? Okay, well, let's do an intro. 
So you were talking about when your animals know you're on Zoom or team. This <laughs> I cannot go a Zoom meeting without this guy. I don't know, like I must talk differently or something because I have three dogs. The other two are fast asleep, but for some reason, this one always knows when I'm on a meeting. This is Boo. <laughs> so sweet. Boo is from the pound. I've had him for a few years. <laughs> <laughs> face, he, looks like, he looks like a little mongoose actually right now. It's adorable. <laughs> oh, hi, Clover. <laughs> I have a human pet too. <laughs> <laughs> okay <little> snack. <laughs> snack. awesome Sorry, well, <laughs> well this is what i say about we just go with everything yeah. on the town halls it's all <laughs> casual <laughs> so what let's talk a little bit more about um let's talk a little bit more about your opinion given how what you've seen over the course of your career that's very long already and uh where do you see what are your thoughts on animal testing uh, you know what actually sorry you guys all know this is like a new teams platform i'm not as familiar as as i was with zoom so like if you have to flag me down because you have a question for jessica flag me down because chances are i might miss so I don't definitely don't need it to be just me asking questions and, and we're always open to this. So yell at me um, or wave at me. But, how, you know, yes, progressive things have happened in Canada with regard to animal testing. Great. Yes, go read your book. Yes, go, go read. <laughs> so after age, she had to switch from the tablet to her book. Sorry. No. Okay. So, so, okay, yes. so, so yes, yes, we know that. However, from the standpoint of, of our organization, where we reach out to, to laboratories and we have a campaign, an ongoing campaign where people can write to the facilities. We have some private facilities, which are a little bit more secretive. We have all mo most, uh, sorry, my dogs are barking in the background, but um, you know, most universities or at least the top 15 universities research centers where people can write to we've written to them we've mm -hmm. phoned them we've reached out on linkedin you know we've done the things and continue to do so of course we're still placing dogs from u.s laboratories in yes. canada because we either get answers like we already have an adopt girls we already have an adoption pro, you know, the vet, the veterinary care worker or the animal care committee or whatever. They'll say we already yeah. have an adoption um, program or we, I mean, you I believe, that? You believe part, part, that? No, I don't believe. Well, I, I did have one. I had one. Uh, I forget. I would disclose. I would totally tell you guys who the university was that said sent me their adoption protocol however that could just be something they send I can't remember which university it was um no I don't entirely believe it I would hate to say that I that I would would consider somebody to lie outright to me however I will say that on several occasions I've called facilities while looking at their website and yeah. seen their animal care committee and they've outright told me they don't use animals and I've been staring at their website <laughs> That's, that's the problem, right? We have this issue of zero accountability, right? Right. So like, and there's, there's no one checking. Yeah. I mean, I'm staring at your website. I can see that you have, you know, you have an animal care committee, but yet you're telling me you don't use animals. So right. I, how, how am I supposed to believe this? Obviously I don't, but so there's, and I did speak with one university, um, I think it was, uh, in Nova Scotia. It's terrible for that. I can't remember off the top, but the and it was in the news actually we posted about it and it was how they were rehoming the animals and cbc actually did a program i think you sent that to me brenda yeah okay. and yeah remember that and so i ended up speaking with the the veterinarian who did that who did this program and we had a great conversation and he said yes i remember your letter because i had sent him a letter and he said i know who you are and he says however you know your letter wouldn't have gone anywhere we're always nervous working with 
organizations such as mm -hmm. yourself. So then I had to say, well, I understand that. I said, however, mm -hmm. I'm not going to protest at your door. I'm right. not going to shame you. I, I literally want to work with you. We have experience with these dogs and we're, I don't, I won't even tell people that it's this u university or that. I just want to say it's a Canadian facility. So at least the, the Canadians and the people of this country know that we're making headway and that universities yeah. or centers are releasing to us. Um, but it was clear that he was himself walking a thin line with whoever right. the administrators are, et cetera. So what are your thoughts? How, how how do we move forward and how do you see moving forward when when it's a secretive world over here? Yeah. I think I think first of all, I think if there was universities or private labs that actually were adopting out their dogs, we would know all about it because it would be a PR communications gift. There would be so much publicizing of this it would become a news story every single time. So I would be very, very suspicious of the universities or labs saying that they're doing it and yet it's private because for the most part, this is something they would want to brag about. Um, they'd be calling people like me and saying, hey, look what we're doing, can you write about it, right? I would be hearing about it. And I don't think it's really happening. And we know that the number of dogs being used in animal testing, research and education in Canada is in the thousands. So, I mean, you might have a few that are being adopted out. Where are all the rest of them going? And we know. Absolutely. Yeah, I think another part of the story that you and I have talked about that has yet to be explored because we don't because we lack the evidence, but I'll bring it up here as something that it's something I'm, I'm hoping to explore more is where these dogs are coming from. Right. So we've had the case yes. in the U.S. Yeah, we've had the case in the U.S. Um, where we I, I know investigators from different organizations that um, go undercover and, and look at these breeding facilities where these beagles are being bred to begin with. and some of my sources tell me that they're being shipped into Canada, that Absolutely. there's vans of dogs, of, of beagles being bred in the U.S. specifically for animal testing that are shoved into vans, driven over the border and brought here to Canada because where else are they coming from? Absolutely. We don't have breeding facilities in Canada as far as I know. So this is another area that I think we can expose to the Canadian public that because they're dogs, they're going to be very pissed off. So I think there's a lot of you know, we've talked about this before. There's a lot of different inroads and strategies. And essentially the goal is to piss off the public. And if you can get the public mad enough about something and dogs are such a great catalyst to do that. Yeah. Yes. Then you can have, you can have laws changed if you piss off enough people. And so honestly, like I am just a vehicle for that. Like just give me a reason to go to major papers with something substantial that has evidence that I can put an opinion on and get people angry about. Um, and then lobbyists go next. And that's what we need is the next step is the lobbyists. And that's why people like Dr. Charo are suffering is because we're, I can put it in the Globe and Mail till my head turns blue, but we need someone to then take the next step. Yeah, and I'm gonna take questions, but I agree with you. And this is, and this is, the, this is the tactic. It, at, number one, the strategy is we already know dogs are the way to go because as we, as I had said, everyone is in love with their dog, has a dog or knows somebody and that's the way it goes. Number two, the key is pissing off the public, not pissing that's off the facilities, not, you know, not, we want to work with the agencies. The system, yeah. at the system yeah. not at the facilities. I get exactly, that. Exactly. Exactly. So um, okay, so Mike and Tamara, uh, to go ahead, Tamara, and apologies, I'm just kind of see the hand and then go from there. No worries. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, yes, thank you. Hi, so my name is Tamara Vedic, and um, I'm an attorney here in New York in U.S. Oh, I did talk to you. Yeah, you did. Oh, and thank you. you. Oh, I told you oh, I would come tonight. You're yeah. for my Oh, right. So, oh, so my question, um, in 1938, here in the U.S., a law was passed that mandated animal testing for every drug before it hit the market. And this law at the time was really because of cosmetics. Women were losing their eyesight because they were putting on things that were allegedly supposed to do who knows what to their eyes, et cetera. And so they were losing their eyesight. So the, this law was passed in 38, and then quite recently, about two years ago, the FDA Modernization Act 2.0 was passed that that sort of, you know, 
uh, reversed the 38 law and that said, you know what, we have all of these other modalities now and you don't necessarily have to test on animals. So I guess my question is twofold. First of all, does can Canadian law mandate testing on animals? And secondly, is there any movement to pass a law if if there is a law that says you must test on animals before a drug goes uh, uh, to market, is there now a movement in Canada like the FDA Modernization Act that says, well, hold on, there are all of these other modalities now? So A and B. Thank you. Uh, Lori, I'll nice to meet you, Tamara. We're going to talk after this. Um, I mean, Lori, I'm going to let you get into the details, but I know here in Canada, we don't do a lot of cosmetic testing in Canada, so I, I believe I believe it's been banned, but it was a, a bit of a a bit of a, a no reason to. We don't do a lot of it here. Exactly. There's a big difference, of course, between cosmetic testing, toxicity testing, and drug testing, and research. So I mean, like in the U.S., the drug testing and, and research, me, um, uh, medical research, it's it still exists. There has been no alternative methods. That have been standardized to allow us to progress and i think that's sort of the problem in all modern societies is that even in the us we they have a center for modern um for alternative methods that's federally funded i believe but it's still not become the standard practice right the gold standard as charlie will often say is yeah. using animal models and that has not changed anywhere and that's the problem but laura you could get more into the details about what is legal and what's not well, let, this is this is the shocking part is that there is no federal legislation protecting animals and research in Canada, and there's one provincial one province in Canada that mentions mentions animals and research, and it's a very vague statement by the Ontario government. So there is no federal legislation in Canada now. T on top of that, I will add, Tamara, that because I worked for an organization in the U.S., so I actually knew more about what was going on in the U.S. with regards to testing prior to then starting the Beagle Alliance. So uh, as well in the U.S. when it comes to animal testing, the USDA, uh, the USDA is somewhat of a transparent, as compared to Canada, um, faction that in which they have a database of mm -hmm. testing facilities where you can a find out what facilities exist both private and public as far as i know there's other databases that work off the usda that you can find animal testing facilities across every state in the united states and number two that database tells you what kind of testing is happening when it's happening and what animals are being tested on. Let okay. me say, okay. in Canada, we have none of that. None of that. So you basically don't even have a law. So Canada doesn't, Canada is not forcing drug manufacturers to test on animals. Yeah, you have to, the law is, the, or is there a law that says you no, must test on animals before it goes to market? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes. But so, there are no welfare laws. There's no welfare There's laws. No welfare laws. So right. is there a, so is there a movement now to to tweak that law that says no, you don't actually have to test on animals. There are We're other modalities. You're working on it. Okay. So the ending of the toxicity testing bill that passed last year, I we all believed was a step in that direction. And so then that opened the door for the Canadian Center for Alternative Methods to then use their work to be able to change the system to allow different modalities like you suggested but now that center has lost funding, funding is potentially closing and the government is not making any moves towards making that bill practical because there are no alternative methods available in canada they're not even looking for them that's the problem that's awful yeah, yeah, we're having a similar we're we're having a similar uh, stalled stalled situation here in that we passed this law two years ago that says you don't have to test on animals, mm -hmm. but the pharmaceutical companies have come back and looked at that law and said it's true now that we don't have to test on animals, but we don't have any guidelines from the yeah. Food and Drug Administration that we can follow so that we are not sued in case something with yeah. the drug goes bad so that's the stage that we're on here legally 
Um, yeah. And sorry to take it like into the legal framework, but that's what no. lawyers do. So but that's a big part of it. That's such a big it part of a big it. Part of it. I mean, you have to have the culture, you have to have the, the legalities, and then you have to have the methods and the systems in place. And so there are steps in those directions, but they're not coming together. It just seems like it's just taking so long. I'm sorry to hear that, but thank yeah. you very much for answering my question. You're thank welcome. you. Nice thank you, Tamara. Thank you for being here. Go so ahead, Mike. We can't hear you, Mike. I think he's muted. Oh, yeah, it says you're muted there, Mike. There you go. It picks the wrong microphone. <laughs> you're good. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> we can keep talking until you wave again. <laughs> the facility is saying or not saying that they they do work with they have a program for uh, exiting the animals part of that might be because they don't want people off the street pestering them to say i want a pup yeah that could be a good point it yeah, yeah. may be a way for an organization like the beagle alliance to kind of strike up some kind of dialogue and or um synergy with them so that when the animals are ready for retirement from the lab, then they would go to the Beagle Alliance for mm -hmm. the distribution to their forever home. Mm -hmm. Well, and and that's the goal. But I do want to thank you, Mike. And that is the goal. And I'm th I think there's so many reasons why they say there's an adoption. You know, but uh, actually, Jessica, I want to touch on the fact that you said that it would be a media storm if they and they would want to tell you. I actually am not entirely sure that's true. Um, it might be, yeah, I'm seeing now that that could possibly be. Yeah, because I know that Guelph University has released beagles. Um, I know mm -hmm. that from Liz White's work. I know oh, that okay. I've, I've even had um, people email me and say, I've either, I have a beagle from Guelph University or mm -hmm. I've had them say my friend got a be. you know, so I've, I've had contact with people who have uh, animals from facilities. However, uh, it's very quiet and usually there, there is there, and I know this from the United States, there's usually NDAs in place. True, and true. yeah, and so th really it's a secretive, it's, it's just so secretive. And, and I do still think that in Canada, it's so, most people don't know that animal testing is going on period. And so therefore, I don't think they want to have anybody That's know anything. Point. Now, maybe I'm thinking that it should be a PR frenzy. Well, it it, of be. course it should be. You'd think that you it's like, it okay, we're moving, but the backlash, because they have, they have them to begin with. That's a good point. Yes. Yeah. And so, and then what, with regard to the cosmetic testing ban in Canada, that became a very, for us as an organization, that became a very deceptive thing that happened. Because all of a sudden, when we're out educating about animal testing, the people who yeah, had people found were. out about the cosmetic, they would say, well, that ended, didn't that just end? And we yeah. then have a further step to say, well, first off, beagles aren't really used in cosmetic testing to begin with, if we're talking about the dogs. Number two, we don't do a lot of cosmetic testing in Canada, as you said. And yeah. so really it was the decept it, it was a great thing. Don't don't yeah. judge yourself. But it it did was somewhat deceptive in yeah. that it wasn't really addressing the issues that go That's on right. in Canada. That's right. That's right. And I think it's also like when you see it's it's marketing in a lot of ways. It's like when you see products that say that they're made of plant-based ingredients and people think that that means they're cruelty-free, right? It's a lot of smoke and mirrors of having it. It's humane washing. And in some ways, the cosmetic ban, the cosmetic testing ban in Canada was somewhat of that because like you said, it, it made people think that, oh, we don't have that here anymore. Absolutely. And people don't yeah. realize, well, actually, we're still testing on tens of thousands of animals. I mean, if you count fish, it's even more in Canada every year. And, and it, you know, what the thing is, is that I find in my work too, is that people are so happy to be placated that the minute you tell them something that makes them feel good, 
that they are so happy to listen to it and they don't want to know that that's not true or it's not quite what they thought. So that's how these things work. It's, it's, it's unfortunate, but that's why we're all here is to burst their bubble. Well, agreed. And you in the media, it, I mean, the media is, is, has become, the media is so very important. And over a number of years, we've seen how important the media can be to even the well-being of its individual citizens and, and, and how it's either the media I find nowadays, and, and please, you know, you would know better than I would, Jessica, but it seems that you've either got the people who absolutely do not believe what anything the media says, or you've got the people who believe absolutely everything. And and so there's almost a divide, you know, there. And so I think you're right in that there's been so much negative that's occurred and mostly occurs in the media that if you say one great thing that happens, people just want it, right? They they yes. want it. And I mean, in terms of, you know, the, the landscape of media in North America, the US and Canada, you know, we can talk about ever since the pandemic, a lot of suspicion and distrust of the media. And I often will tell people like, but I do, I work in the media. Like they, they let me write these things in the media. So you got to take every writer, every reporter, every publication with a grain of salt. But the unfortunate thing is that human nature, I believe is, is like you're saying is that if you give people what they want to hear, they're going to go with it. And so I like to think that when I work for publications, the mainstream publications, the Winnipeg Free Press, the Toronto Star Global Mail, it's giving me an opportunity to write to the people about things they don't want to hear about, but I'm hopefully doing it in a way that they'll continue to read, even if it makes them uncomfortable. Um, and I, I, I'm very careful about my, my intros, my leads in all of my articles, not to immediately turn people off. I really want to bring people in gently because these are the people that we want to be reading it, like you've said. And it's a lot of the times things that don't, they don't want to hear and they don't want to read and they don't want to know. So I mean, it's important for advocates like you and groups like this to continue to very carefully walk that line of bringing people in to educate them and to let them know the horrible things are going on, but in ways that doesn't make them just turn around and walk away. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly the thin line is that you, you want to attract and not repel, but you still want to get your point across and, and, uh, and and it's it's tricky because there's a lot out there in the world and there's a lot of distractions and it's it's Clever hard. Not Clever, Clever not not, yeah. That that'll be well. It's it's just past the eight thirty mark, so we know that you want Clover in bed. So <laughs> <laughs> so you know I want to respect that and and so that's a kind of a perfect way to leave it. Is you know is is on a clever note and <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. I we could all. I mean, this is a great group. We could all probably go on and ask oh, more questions, and yeah, for hours. a long time, right? <laughs> but we're always in for doing it another time. So please, okay. yeah, yeah. So thank you so very much for sharing your insights and your experience, and just you know, honestly, the amount of work you have done for animals over the years is just incredible, incredible, and and continue to do so in Canada and. Let's hope that we see the change that we want to see in our lifetime and, and going forward. That's the goal. So thank you, Jessica, for everything. Well, thank you so much for having me. We've so, got to be part of the community, right? We only work if we work together. So thank yeah, you for having yeah. me. Agreed, agreed. And thank you all, as usual, for being here, because this is the whole point, is for us to build a community and get together and, and then go out in the world and take it to everybody else. So thank you guys so much. Um, we thank will you keep for you posted. organizing. Absolutely. Thank you for organizing. <laughs> okay, we will see you. Bye. We'll see you at the next town hall.